Hello to you, my friends. My name is Rob Booker. Welcome to the webinar today. Glad to have you here. If you're watching the recording, we are uh, happy to bring you this recording of our webinar today. I am Rob. I'm joined by Justin, my friend from Forest Park FX. Hi, Justin. Hey, Rob. Good morning. Uh, I want to introduce myself to those of you that don't know who I am and introduce you to Forest Park as well. My name is Rob Booker. Uh, I've been a currency trader for 14 years. I was the worst trader in the world from 2000 to 2001. I am the author of Adventures of a Currency Trader. I'm the creator of the Trifecta Trading System, the founder of TFL 365 and the Traders Podcast, and the host of Trifecta Live. It is a live trading event in Orlando, Florida, coming up on February 6th through the 8th. If you're here in the webinar, I will send you an invitation to that event. I'm joined today by my friend Justin Hertzberg from Forest Park FX. And we're going to talk today about how the FX brokerage business really works. I don't think we're going to say anything that is scandalous, but you are going to be able to ask questions and sort of get the truth about the way things really work and why things work the way they do, why brokers keep consolidating and what some of the trends in FX currency dealing will be in 2015 and much more. I do want to share with you this risk disclaimer before we begin and remind you to read the disclaimer here on the screen and remember that before you decide to participate in the Forex market, you should carefully consider your investment objectives, level of experience, and your risk appetite. Most importantly, don't invest money you can't afford to lose, and there is considerable exposure to risk in any off-exchange, foreign exchange transaction. And remember that leverage can be dangerous, that trading is not suitable for everyone, and that you should consult with your financial advisor before you decide to deposit any funds with an FX dealer. Uh, Justin, did I suitably cover the risk management portion of the webinar that's necessary for you? Sounds pretty good. Okay, great. I want to give you some background about my friend Justin. I've known Justin for a couple of years now. Um, he like I am, actually. We're both actually uh, former attorneys, Justin. I don't know if we've ever talked much about that before. Um, you practiced as a securities and commercial litigator. You've worked as a trader and in-house counsel for several brokerage firms. You launched Forest Park FX in March of 2013, and you are a CFTC-registered NFA member, and you introduce traders to FX brokers. And um, why don't I turn it over to you for a moment. You can tell me just a little bit more about what you guys do at Forest Park FX. Sure. And thanks for the uh, good introduction. Uh, first off, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be a part of uh, your group and uh, interact with some of your clients. Um, and uh, yeah, in, in short, um, Forest Park is an introducing broker. Um, some of you on the webinar are probably already clients of ours. Um, some of you might not know what an introducing broker is or does. Um, but at our core, we are a relationship firm. And what we look to do is create brokerage solutions that meet the needs of our clients. And what that means for you specifically varies. Um, for some clients, uh, really for all clients, what we, what we try to do as a base offering is reduce your trading costs. And we can do that through cash back rebates or negotiating better spreads for you based upon your particular style of trading. Um, this is a great way for everyone to save money while they're ascending their own learning curve. Uh, and it just helps to keep you in the game, helps to improve your risk return. Uh, and pretty much any time you get money for nothing, it's, uh, it's better. Um, we also help uh, our clients with uh, their trading platforms and technology. Um, a lot of traders are very comfortable with MT4. A lot of traders are not comfortable with MT4. Some require working with a VPS to run certain algorithms. Some don't even know what a VPS is. Uh, some don't know what they're necessarily looking for. Uh, what we like to do is kind of go through a consultative approach with our clients and figure out who they are as a trader, what their particular needs are, and, and ultimately connect them with the right technology, the right trading platforms that suit their trading. Uh, we are also uh, our client's sort of first line of defense, uh, 
kind of harping back to my legal background. Um, we represent you. Um, a lot of introducing brokers have built their businesses around representing the brokers that they send clients to. Our business focuses on actually representing the client, the trader. Uh, you are our first priority, and uh, whenever there's an issue involving your account, we represent you. We don't take the side of the broker. So if you have an issue opening, opening an account, you have an issue with a bad fill on one of your trades, you have uh, an issue with a missed stop loss or something along those lines, uh, we encourage all our clients to come to us because we have a lot of uh, leverage with each of the brokers that we work with and we can help you get to the right person and get your complaint heard and resolved quickly um, because what you should be doing is focusing on your trading and let us handle all the other things that are a distraction from that. Um, and lastly and, and, and not least importantly is we are trying to help you make a better brokerage decision and that means finding the right broker the right pricing model, the right trading pl platform uh, that, that, that suits you as a trader. Uh, we'll call it, kind of go through the different brokers that there are and, and the different types of pricing and execution models that there are. Uh, but at the end of the day, not every broker is the right fit for every client. And just because your friend's brother's neighbor's son, who happens to be a big trader and recommends Oanda as the best broker, that might be the case, but it's probably the case for him and not necessarily for you. And so it's important to kind of do your own due diligence and, and work with someone who is impartial and objective to help you find the right uh, broker for your specific trading strategy. Uh, and, and that's really what we do, but, but we are a solutions firm, as I said in the very beginning, and we're here to, to ultimately deliver a solution that suits you. Everything is custom tailored to our specific clients, specific needs. and. Uh, that's, uh, that's what we do, and um, we are not the, the gifted uh, marketers that uh, Rob is, um, but we, uh, we've grown our business quite considerably in the past two years, and we do it largely by referral. Um, we've really done no marketing in the past 18 months, and, and our business keeps growing because our, our clients are very happy, and they're kind enough to tell two friends and tell two friends and so on and so forth, and so we, we only hope that continues. Awesome. It's uh, so good to have you here. It's it's really rare in this business uh, of currency dealing, and I know all of you feel this way. It's it's really rare to ever find anybody that can give you a straight answer about how any of this stuff works. And every time I do a webinar or event and I talk about how dealers really work or what's really going on in the business, it's always like really well attended because everybody kind of has these lingering questions about why brokers act the way they do. And I've been uh, a witness to Justin helping traders get stuff resolved with brokers. And I've had dinner with Justin where Justin doesn't have any traders around and speaks about his experiences in helping them. And he genuinely uh, has always struck me as the kind of individual that, that puts his clients first. And I really like that about Justin. So I sought him out when I wanted to do my yearly webinar about how brokers really work. Now, there's been some consolidation in the business. And this is one thing I wanted to talk to you about, Justin, is that um, it, it just seems like hopefully we've reached near the end of all of this. But I remember just a few years ago, there were all kinds of different brokers out there and they all seemed to be reasonably strong and they had all made it through some of the more restrictive regulations. What's going on with regulation right now? What brokers do you have that you send traders to? What brokers did you used to have that you no longer send traders to? Yeah, it, it's, been, uh, it's been a rapidly changing landscape. Um, and you're right. I mean, if we go back three years, there were probably 20 different brokers uh, in the U.S. And, and just for, for those, I, I know you have a, a large international following. Just for time's sake, I've kind of limited this to the U.S., but the same patterns are being seen uh, across the globe right now. Um, just in the U.S. about three years ago, there were probably 20 different uh, FX brokers that you could choose from. Uh, and then we've had a major overhaul of uh, compliance and regulatory environment. Uh, we have the Dodd-Frank Act. We have um, 
new management or new uh, chief regulators within the CFTC, which is the, the overarching governing body for Forex and futures trading. And um, the, the, the biggest change is the increased regulatory obligations. So before, uh, firms could pop up relatively quickly. They could operate with a small amount of net capital, which is basically the funds that the company needed to set aside in the event of some catastrophe to make sure that they could repay their clients. And that went up from a couple hundred thousand dollars to now having to have $20 million literally set aside. Uh, and that was a, a major lead out of a lot of firms. Uh, and just recently, I think these are from the past 18 months, we've, we've seen FXDD sell its business to FXCM. Uh, Alpari simply left the U.S. IBFX sold its business to FXCM. ILQ couldn't keep up with regulation and they basically shut down their U.S. business. Uh, so we've lost a lot of the competition. Um, some of the other factors that have led to this consolidation and mass exodus um, is a pressure to compete with one another. So years ago when I first got into the business, Rob, you got in even before I did, um, sort of retail FX trading and, and electronic trading was in its infancy. And the market was expanding at an exponential rate because you were literally creating FX trading interest out of nothing. There was, there was great opportunity for marketing on TV, on websites, uh, the advent of online trading platforms and MT4. Uh, everyone became interested in uh, FX and lots of firms were popping up to take advantage of this. Um, over the past couple of years, as the environment has matured, um, there is a lot of competition now amongst the brokers. They, they can't operate with a marketplace that's uneducated. Now there are so many websites out there that are talking about this broker and that broker and comparing one to the other. And, uh, and the trading public got smarter. And they started asking more probing questions and they started demanding better pricing, better service, better technology. And that competition took away a lot of the profitability for some of these brokers. And, and like IBFX, I'm sorry, ILQ is a great example. They were a profitable company, but competing in this environment just became more and more and more difficult. And they simply elected to say, you know what, we can kind of get out of the business right now and, uh, and focus on other areas that are a little bit more profitable for us. Um, the other thing that happens in a mature marketplace is that the cost of marketing and, and client acquisition um, skyrockets. Instead of creating new Forex traders out there, there's sort of a finite pool of people interested. And um, these firms are, are pressed to market themselves, to distinguish themselves, and, um, and, and somehow find a way to attract more of that finite pie over to their broker as opposed to someplace else. Uh, and as that cost of finding a new client went up, uh, along with the fact that prices, the spreads have come down and down and down, uh, the profitability just wasn't there. And so a lot of smaller firms are looking at their book of business and uh, they're basically saying to themselves, well, you know what, I can see the writing on the wall. Let me, let me sell my business to FXCM. Let me sell my business to Forex.com because they're the bigger boys. Let them worry about it. Let them spend $100 million a year on marketing. And, uh, and I'll, you know, I'll get paid my money and I'll move on to my next business venture. And, uh, and that's really what we've seen. And so we're now down to a few brokers, uh, which is to the chagrin of many traders, at least here in the U.S., um, now you work with you you work with traders all over the world. Yes. Oh, yeah. We have yeah. A, a global business. We've got um, probably twenty brokers outside the U.S. that we work with, um, and and I'm sure you've got clients here. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. We've got people from all over the world here. In fact, um, let us know in the webinar here where are you from. Just grab your sure. keyboard and let us know where you're from here. UK, uh, Sweden, um, Dubai, Singapore, UK, uh, Madrid, Canada, Thailand, Netherlands, United States, Spain, Brazil, Qatar, USA, Barcelona, Las Vegas, 
uh, Alberta, France, England, Portugal, UK, Dubai, Texas, <laughs> El Salvador, Chicago, USA. Uh, nobody from Arizona, Maryland. So we've got traders from all over the place. And if you're trading internationally and you're like thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, well, I trade with Alpari. That's because you're international. In the U.S., Alpari is gone. In the U.S., FXDD is gone. Uh, everywhere, IBFX is gone. And we lost some of those brokers. But some of that consolidation has happened all over the world as well, Justin. And like you said, it's a reflection on regulations in some areas, in capital requirements in other areas, in the fact that some of these firms realized that they could not do business cost effectively wherever they were located. Many of you don't know, and Justin, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, and I'm not making this up. Um, in Japan, Yahoo is an FX broker. Did you know that? I, I did not know that. Yeah. That's pretty interesting, actually. So, so I spoke in Japan at a conference uh, this last year, and one of the brokers that showed up and wanted to do some business together was Yahoo. And I was just taken completely by surprise. Um, absolutely wild. And um, I'm going to ask a few questions to you here. And I'm going to even type on my screen while we do some of this. There are some natural questions that come up uh, when someone's thinking about all these questions about brokers. If you are based in the United States... It is illegal, theoretically. <laughs> okay. We're going we're gonna to encourage you to do the right thing, of course. But it is le illegal, theoretically, to open a, an FX trading account outside the U.S. That's correct. Right, Justin? That is absolutely correct. Yeah. So I know some traders, I'm not going to lie to you on this webinar, uh, I know some traders that open up their accounts offshore and whatever else, but um, that's a that's a question for another webinar, <laughs> for another time with another group of people. Um, but yes, so you have some brokers that are available to you in the U.S. and some brokers that are available to you offshore. And Justin, in total, counting the brokers that you represent offshore for people outside the U.S. and inside the U.S., you work with... 20 or more FX dealers? Yes, and uh, that's that's about right. Probably somewhere in the 20 to 30 range. And uh, I know there's probably people on this webinar going, well, there's like 400, 500 brokers. Yeah. And, uh, and that is true. Um, but not everyone is reputable. Not everyone is well capitalized. Not everyone uh, is fair and balanced. Right. And when we send clients someplace, we want to make sure that they're going someplace safe. Okay, so that was my next point. And I really wanted to bring this up to everybody here because um, it is it is really important to choose a broker who is likely to be, <laughs> to be around six months from now. And that's one of the reasons to get on this webinar and talk to Justin and and ask for his opinion. I'm not going to give specific opinions about specific brokers on this webinar, but Justin can give you an honest and specific opinion about your broker or the choices that you make. And it, it's not going to it's not going to benefit Justin one way or the other any better to give you a particular answer. It's not going to make Justin more money to give you an answer one way or the other. And I, and that's one of the reasons that I do these webinars is that year after year, I hear from traders who open up their account with a broker that makes some pretty extraordinary promises or gives account deposit bonuses or some other things. And then six months later, all of their money is gone and they've just had a terrible experience. And I want to help to protect you. I get no financial incentive from you here, everybody today, opening up your account anywhere in particular, zero. Um, it's just important to me that you're around because I truly love traders and I want you to put your account somewhere that is going to work for you. Now, I want to move on, so I'm going to, I'm just going to basically summarize this point that Justin makes often. Is all of this consolidation good or bad for traders? And I want to sum it up with this. I think that regardless of the type of trading you do, long-term, short-term, robotic, algorithmic, short-term scalping, swing trading, whatever you do, 
there is still a broker out there that can meet your needs. And it's not going to be perfect in every case, but you need two things. First, you need to get some, you need to get with a broker that's going to be around six months from now or well capitalized, reputable, run by people who've been around for a long time. And then you need to be prepared that every broker is imperfect. And someone like Justin is going to be there for you if something goes wrong. And something always goes wrong, Justin. <laughs> like, there's always going to be an experience where if an order doesn't get filled correctly or something goes wrong. And you're always, you're going to want to have somebody on your side. And I, I have, this has been my own experience. It is just really important to, to have somebody like Justin in your, in your contacts in your phone. You want to, I'll give you a Justin's contact information later, but you're going to want to have somebody like that available to you. Um, so uh, you're going to have some questions naturally about, um, about it, whether it makes a difference for you to go through someone like Justin, like an IB, an introducing broker. And I, will, I want to talk about that right now just to make sure everybody understands what an introducing broker is. What an introducing broker is, for those of you that don't know, is an introducing broker does exactly what you think it sounds like. They introduce you to a firm. So Justin might introduce you to Forex.com or FXCM, or if you live outside the country of the United States, FXDD or Alpari or one of the brokers that are available offshore as well. And so Justin's going to introduce you to that broker. And we're going to talk to you a little bit about what Justin does with that um, commission or payment that is made to him in exchange for making that recommendation. Um, I think we've kind of covered that you have a lot of brokers to choose from, Justin. So I want to move on to this question that I have, I have had this question sent to me already in the webinar 15, 20 times. What is the difference between a dealing desk and a non-dealing desk broker? And does it matter today for someone that's choosing a broker? There is so much of an argument going on about this. Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I, I get that question all the time. And there's a lot of stigma with, with a dealing desk. But in short, um, and I'll, I'll make a comparison to trading stocks because people are typically a little bit more familiar with that. Uh, the stock market is like a true market. There are a bunch of buyers on one side and a bunch of sellers on the other. And when you go out and buy IBM in your E-Trade account, for example, you're not buying IBM from E-Trade. You're buying it from some other guy that's selling IBM somewhere else in the world. That's a true market. Um, and that is essentially a non-dealing desk market where you just have a group of buyers on one side and a group of sellers on the other. And you have a broker that is pairing you up, that is that is allowing you to find each other. Um, and so like FXCM, which has now gone completely non-dealing desk, that's essentially what they're doing. You're a buyer, let's say, of the euro on one side. And they are pulling in all of these prices, all of these quotes on the euro dollar from 20 different banks, let's say. And they're streaming them all in, they're aggregating them for you, and they're showing you the best bid and the best offer that all of those different banks are streaming in. And so you've got you on the left side, let's say, and you've got 20 different banks on the right side, and you're just dealing with the one that's giving you the best price at that particular moment in time. Um, and that's non-dealing desk. It means that FXCM is a mere facilitator or conduit for you to ultimately get to the other person on your trade so that when you buy euro, you're selling it to someone else out there, some other bank on the other side. Uh, and I like your, your drawing there. That's actually covering it quite well. Um, <laughs> this is, um, so the banks stream the quotes to the broker and the broker displays these quotes up here based on those bank feeds and the broker shows those prices to you and then you click on those prices. Now with a non-dealing desk, how, once again, how is that trade, how is that trade processed with a non-dealing desk model? So you're saying that that trade kind of goes straight through to one of these banks on a non-dealing desk and the broker is just the middle person? That's, that's exactly it. They are bringing you all the different prices from the different banks that they work with 
and they are aggregating them. So they are showing you that, let's say, the best bid on the euro dollar is coming from bank number seven, and the best offer is coming from bank number nine. Um, and then a moment later, the best bid can be from bank number one, and the best offer could be from bank number three. Uh, it's constantly changing, but what FXCM in this case is doing is they're aggregating it, and they're showing you the best of everything that they've got. So you're choosing, and then they're immediately routing that buy or sell order to the bank that is showing you that price. Uh, and what this ultimately means is FXCM has no vested interest in the outcome of your trade. If you make money or lose money, they don't care. All they're now collecting is that spread that they're, uh, is that commission that they're charging you. Uh, now, this does it does it really matter already, then? I mean, does it really matter if they're they've got a dealing desk or not anymore? Like years ago, I walked on the on the floor of a major worldwide currency dealer and the dealing desk, this is like uh, nine years ago. I walked on the floor of the dealing desk, everybody, and the dealing desk employees, the, the, the men, the guys running the dealing desk were making jokes, <laughs> literally like on the dealing desk floor. They were making jokes about taking out people's orders. Like literally, Justin, I was witness to it. Like I was right there. And I I witnessed a phone call from the where a guy was on the phone at the dealing desk with a customer and he was winking and laughing silently to his partner and I was horrified, Justin. Um Yeah. Yeah, so that's so that's this that's the stigma the dealing desk model has and and um, the best example for that right now would be to look at forex.com okay. forex.com has been a dealing desk broker since their inception what does that essentially mean so instead of streaming in all of those different prices from the banks and just facilitating trading between you and those banks forex.com is now sitting in the middle and they are the counterparty to every trade you place. So when you buy the euro, it means someone on the desk at forex.com sold you the euro. They are essentially a, a market maker. You're buying from them and you are selling to them on every single trade. Yeah, so imagine the broker's got a warehouse where they're storing all the trades. And so you take a trade with the broker, they warehouse it, and then as they want to get rid of that trade inventory, they go to the banks themselves and get rid of that inventory. So they've got some risk on the books that they are holding because they're holding uh, a certain number of trades. And that, that's be, because they're dealing directly with you and it's not getting passed straight through to a bank, there's always this feeling that some shenanigans could occur, right, Justin? Absolutely. And, and there is built into this model uh, a, a sense of a zero-sum game, which is if I as the trader make money, the broker has the propensity to lose money. And if I lose money, the broker should be making money. And, and that's where the, the stigma of dealing desks comes in. And you're 100% right, Rob, uh, with your story about visiting the, the floor of a dealing desk firm, in that years ago, especially when there was lack of information and in-depth comparisons of one broker to another and, and not as much transparency of pricing that brokers would do what we're all what we've all heard is like stop loss hunting. They would say, oh I can see we've got a couple traders at this level. Let me just push the market up another pip or two and we'll knock them out, make all the money on those traders and then we'll bring it right back down. Yeah, and they could and they could literally there was the rumor of course that they could do that for just a couple of traders, not for everybody. Correct, yeah. and, and they could. They would, they would literally show different pricing to different traders right. within their own brokerage uh, because the regulation wasn't there because it was like the Wild West. You know, anything went. Yeah. And, uh, and, and this is where that, that stigma comes from. Uh, nowadays, what's left, at least in the U.S. and, and, and really offshore, a lot, of the, a lot of the dealing desk brokers are very transparent they are not showing one price to one client and another price to another client. They simply can't get away with it anymore. You know, if you get stopped out on a position and you start to compare that, that level 
uh, at broker A to brokers B, C, D, E, and F, and you go, you know, you took me out at, at you know, in the euro at uh, 118.57, um, but on all these other brokers, the, the lowest bid on the euro was 118.62. They simply can't justify it anymore. And so with that transparency, with everyone knowing what every other broker is doing and showing, they can't justify and say, well, the market went there. Well, the market really didn't go there. So they can't get away with what they used to. And Forex.com as a dealing desk broker is very honest. I've, I've visited pretty much all of the, the floors of the uh, different brokers. I've met with the CEOs, and I've seen the desks, and I've seen the way that they operate. And I know the way that they operate now. And um, it's very much on the up and up. And a dealing desk firm may very well be the absolute right broker for a certain style of trading. It is the right broker for a certain style of trading. Um, and there's nothing inherently wrong or dangerous about it anymore. Um, but, uh, but people don't know that. People read on Forex Peace Army or Forex Factory some bad reviews, and they get very scared off by it. Um, and that's not necessarily uh, the right sentiment. Um, you know, the answer is ultimately everything depends. Depends upon what you specifically need as a trader. And we have plenty of traders that absolutely have to trade with a dealing desk firm. And why is that? that? So this is interesting, and it might become a little bit complicated to understand. And Rob, help me out if I'm going off. Yeah, no, this is good. I think everybody, does everybody want to hear why a dealing desk might be a good choice for somebody? We're getting a lot of yeses. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. Okay, so here we go. Um, when, when we're talking about the, the diagram above with, uh, with a non-dealing desk firm, let's say FXCM is the broker sitting in the middle and they're facilitating your trading between banks. So a couple things are happening here. One is you place an order to buy. That order to buy goes into FXCM and FXCM servers and then that order gets routed out to the best um, bank on the other side. Well, there's an extra hop in that routing because instead of going directly to the bank, your order is first going to FXCM, and then it's going to the bank. And we live in a millisecond world. So if you are a scalper, if you are someone that's extremely price sensitive, or if you are trading in a volatile market, the extra time that it takes your order to get routed to that bank might change the profitability on your trade completely. It might take a profitable strategy and make it unprofitable. It is also a problem if you are trading in large size. So let's say your average trade size is 20 lots, 30 lots, uh, 2 or 3 million per trade. Um, the bank that you're dealing with might be showing you the best bid or the best offer at any one moment in time. But they might not be willing to fill your order for 2 or 3 million. They might be willing to fill you for two or three hundred thousand, two or three lots out of the twenty or thirty that you're trading. And so you think you're going to get filled at this great price, but you only end up getting ten percent of your order filled and then you get what's called a requote or slippage. Yeah. And that requote or slippage can change the risk return of your trade, the profitability of your strategy. Um, and that's what happens with a non dealing desk firm. Yeah, that's why I when I trade size, um, I always my trades are always with a dealing desk broker that can decide to take that risk or not. So a dealing desk has the authority to just warehouse the trade. And if they know me and they know my trading and they know what to do with my trade, they'll take the whole trade on right away as opposed to, you know, like sending it out to people to, to agree with or not. It's, it's less like an auction and more like a yes or no decision that's made on the spot. Yeah, it's, that's exactly right. When you deal with a dealing desk firm, really what you see is what you get. And for instance, Forex.com is a dealing desk firm. They are always standing ready to buy at least 5 million um, or, or 50 lots at any moment in time at the price that you see. And because there's only one hop, your order is only going from your computer to Forex.com, the time it takes to get your order there and executed is much smaller and your order execution is instant. So the second your order gets there, if it's five million or less, they're filling it at the price that's there. So you don't get slippage, you don't get requotes. 
you get exactly the price that you wanted at the moment you wanted it. And, uh, and if you're a scalper, you need to get filled at the exact price that you're looking for. And, um, and so that's why a dealing desk firm works. And it can work if you're a small client or you're a large client. Uh, it just depends on your strategy. And some strategies are more suitable for dealing desks. Some are not. Um, but uh, you want to make sure at a, at a minimum that you know, you're still working with a reputable broker. Um, and there are plenty of dealing desk firms out there that we don't work with that the second they have you as a profitable trader, they start playing games with your account or they don't let you withdraw your funds um, or they disappear with your money. This happens all the time. Yeah, it happens. It happens webinar. unbelievably. It's a common thing, everyone. And you, I'm not, I don't want to put the fear of God in anybody or be a conspiracy theorist, but some of you are trading with a firm that is treating you really well right now, but is not on stable financial ground. And I know that some of you have questions about some of that stuff. And I'm not on this webinar going to go through a list of brokers and tell you what I think about each one's financial condition. But I am going to encourage you at the end to get in touch with Justin and talk to him about where you're at. And once again, it does one way or the other, it doesn't, it's not going to make a difference to Justin or I. But your success or failure, or I hate to see traders with a firm like PFG or with a, with a firm that goes bankrupt later on or a firm based in the Caribbean or some crazy European island or whatever. You know, I hate to see it because I care about you all a lot. I've been in this business for a long time and I have a longstanding reputation for caring about how you're doing. And it, it makes a difference to me that you know whether or not you're at a place that uh, is likely to be around six months from now, 12 months from now, or whatever. Yeah. So. And, and Rob, I, I don't want to go too off topic here, and I know we're kind of up against some time constraints, but I actually just got an email a moment ago that FinFX, which uh, historically has taken U.S. clients, has actually sent out an email saying they'll no longer service U.S. residents as of January 30th. Yeah. Um, you know, and this is... This is an interesting bit of news, um, but it's, you know, one of the things that, that we always try to stay ahead of is making sure that your broker is going to be around, your broker is going to continue to service your business, and you can trade uninterrupted. Um, and, uh, and so it's, it's you, you have to be, you know, you have to be careful. If a broker disappears with your money, uh, it doesn't mean that I pocketed it as your introducing broker. I'm just guilty by association. Rob, you're guilty by association. If... Uh, if, uh, if some recommendation you made turned out to be poor. And so we like to do a lot of our due diligence for our clients. I like to visit my brokers on site. I've, I've traveled all over to, to meet the actual principals of the company, to see the dealing desk, to meet the traders. Uh, because if I'm going to stick my neck out there and I'm going to make a rec recommendation to a client, I have to stand behind that. I'm, I'm liable and responsible for my clients. You're my first priority. And, uh, and uh, you know, I think that's, a, that's the role of a good introducing broker. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I want to I say a few things here as we uh, continue. We're going to repeat this webinar with new information coming up next week, next Monday. We're going to continue this webinar, and we're going to answer additional questions. We're going to talk about more about what happens to your trade when it gets to the broker. I'm going to talk more about what this, this warehousing is and uh, why it matters to you. We're going to talk more about the terms ECN. We're going to talk about straight through processing. We're going to talk about those terms and we're going to discuss some stories about the, how you know uh, some things that you would want to know about brokers. But for now, I want to give you all uh, some contact information <laughs> for Justin without my drawings on the screen. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to straight up tell you right now if if you want to know more about the brokerage business, if you want to talk to Justin about your broker or get some help in choosing a broker, I want to encourage you to contact Justin. One of the best ways to stay in touch with Justin is to email him. I'm going to copy his email address and put it into the chat window. Um and I'm going to put his direct phone number into the chat window. And we didn't get a chance to talk about this today, but when we come back on the next webinar, what I want to talk about is that, um, I'm just going to say it straight out here, 
Um, what Justin does that's unique in this business, Justin returns a portion of the commission given to him directly to the traders. So what happens in a normal introducing broker relationship is the broker pays the introducing broker uh, a commission on every trade or round turn taken by the trader. So the introducing broker hopefully provides some service and some uh, add-ons or some indicators or some strategies or some analysis or whatever. And the broker pays the introducing broker. So FXCM will pay an introducing broker or whatever. What Justin does is he returns a majority portion in most instances of that commission directly to the traders so that what happens is you are lowering your trading costs. Now you might say, um, that's crazy. The first time I met Justin, I said, that's the dumbest business model I've ever seen. <laughs> like I said, that's insane. <laughs> What's happened though, is that Justin has built a really good business with a lot of customers and has been really successful because he puts the client first. And this, so what happens when you trade with Justin is your, your base expenses don't necessarily go up with the broker. In fact, by simply working with Justin, you lower your trading costs. Simply put, you get a portion of the money that would have gone to somebody else or to the broker. You get a portion of that money given back to you. It's pretty exceptional. And once again, um, I want to encourage you to get in touch with Justin. You can go straight to the website, but you can actually just email Justin or contact him on Skype or call his direct phone number and get in touch with him. This is not the only webinar that we're going to do. We are going to come back on Monday, January 19th, and we are going to continue this discussion and talk more about the terminologies, about the things that you want to watch out for. And um, so let, let me just, um, yeah, about VPSs, about all kinds of stuff like that. So just let me know if you're out there and you're, and you're on the webinar right now live, we've got a few hundred traders here. Are you interested in talking to Justin some more about the brokerage business? Let me just get a yes or no. Okay, yes, 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 yes. Okay, tons, tons of yeses out there. Um, I'm happy to hear that. So the best way to do that is contact Justin at that contact information that I provided to you below. And, um, oh gosh, lots of yeses coming through. All right, so that's awesome. Um, I'm so happy to hear that. I've recorded every moment of this webinar and I will process this recording and post it on the web today. I will give Justin a copy of the webinar and I will just simply post it up on YouTube as well and um, provide an unlisted YouTube link for all of you out there to watch this webinar and uh, get in touch with Justin. So thanks for being here, everybody, today. It was so spectacular to, ha to spend some time with you, Justin. Anything you want to say, Justin, as we conclude here on our first webinar? No, just uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to interact with you, Rob, and, and your clients, and, uh, and hopefully we can help uh, a lot of the people on this webinar and, and listening to the recording. I, I know we can help <laughs> pretty much everyone. Um, and, and we'd love to. I mean, we, we grow our business by helping our clients, and uh, we pretty much don't have any clients where we haven't added immediate and tangible value. Uh, and I'm confident we can do that, and i um, happy to answer any questions. No question is, uh, is too dumb. Uh, the, what is, what's the saying? The, the only dumb question is the one you don't ask. Um, so reach out to me. All my information is there. I'm incredibly accountable and responsible. And uh, I'm happy to help, even if it doesn't result in us working together. Let me be a resource. Let me be uh, an objective person to help you uh, sort of satisfy your own curiosities and get some of the answers you need. And, uh, and that's it. I look yeah. forward to, to interacting with everyone again next week. I got to say, other than me, you're the only person in the world that would say that on a webinar to a bunch of currency traders. You're the only person that would offer to help people without some kind of promise of remuneration or financial return. So everyone, you're... You really have somebody special here on the line with me today, and I do encourage you, please stay in touch with them. I'll send out Justin's contact information in an email that includes a link to the recording for today's webinar. I'm Rob Booker, and I will see you again on Monday. You are automatically registered for that next webinar. You don't need to do anything. By registering for the first webinar today, you're registered for the second, so you will receive notices and reminders about that webinar coming up 
on Monday, January 19th. I'm Rob Booker on behalf of Justin, my partner in this webinar. Wish you all the best in your trading, and we will see you again very soon.